This is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, and welcome to another edition of the Chicken Head Chronicles. This episode has been a long time coming, almost 40 years now. It's time for me to dig a little bit deeper into the Commodore VIC-20, the computer I cut my teeth on. I first saw a Commodore PET computer when I was in fifth grade, way back in the 70s. We had one on a rolling cart that they would take from classroom to classroom and let us use it for maybe an hour or so a week. So that was my first introduction to computers. Then my friends and I started going down to the public library. They had an Apple II down there that you could rent for or use for an hour or so for free. And we'd go down there and play games, play on the computer. But what really caught my eye is when my cousin Matt and I were at a county fair one time in the very early 80s and I saw a Commodore VIC-20 on display, a little booth where they had a Commodore VIC-20 out there and they were playing a muck on it, the Berserk clone and oh my goodness, full color graphics, beautiful sound for less than $150. I was flabbergasted. Now I was also 11 or 12 years old at the time and I didn't have $150. So I talked to my mother and the negotiations began, but ultimately we found one on sale at YZ's department store for $89 and I got my first Commodore VIC-20. I believe we got an Omega Race cartridge with it, but no data set. So a lot, many, many hours playing Omega Race, which my mother loved to play with me too, which was really cool. And hours upon hours of typing in programs from the awesome VIC-20 manual. That's probably the best manual ever written for a computer. Typing in the programs and then leaving my VIC-20 on for days because I didn't want to lose what I typed. Ultimately though, we picked up a data set and I started using that, creating more programs, saving more things to it. And I started programming in basic for myself and creating games for myself and, and my, with some help of some, some of my friends. Games that I still have to this day on my original data set, which is right here. This is the same one I had when I was a kid. So the VIC-20 really put me on a path that would help guide the rest of my life as I'm still in the IT industry today. But let's take a look at the VIC-20 itself. Now my original VIC-20 is long gone, but I had some time in the 80s colored the entire thing black with a, with a magic marker or a Sharpie marker. I have no idea why I did it. And I remember seeing it through the 80s and maybe once or twice in the 90s, but then I lost track of it. I don't have any recollection of selling it, so it may still be in my mother's basement somewhere. This little beauty I picked up on eBay about a year ago and it's in beautiful, beautiful shape. This was actually an estate sale that a guy was, was selling things on on eBay. Uh, and I think the original owner probably never hadn't used it in years. It came with a bunch of really great brochures, really great manuals, things that I've actually put up on the VIC-20 Facebook group last year, and I'll, I'll see if I can link to those. Now this one, as you can see here, is one of the original VIC-20s, one of the original runs, because it has the 9-volt two-prong adapter. It also has a nice little power rocker switch there and a 9-pin Atari joystick port. So we move along the back, we have the cartridge port, and the cartridges are sometimes a little tricky to insert in there. You have to give them a good solid push. So if you get one of these uh, used and the cartridge port doesn't seem to be working right, just work it a little bit, you'll get it in there. And after 39 years, the cartridge port can sometimes get a little bit gummed up, so take some isopropyl alcohol and clean that right up. Next, we have the five pin video port. Now this is the same port used on the uh, original Commodore 64s too, the first runs of those and it'll use a standard five pin cable. Same one the Atari series of uh, computer uses. Great composite cable in there. Over here, we have a standard serial interface for the Commodore. This is the IEC interface used for disk drives and printers. Here we have the data set interface that's used for the data set. They also use this a lot now to get five, put, five volt power off one of these lines here for things like the SD to IEC adapter. 
Now over here, we've got our modem port. So you, they call this the user port. You can take your beautiful little modem like this 1200 baud Commodore and slot her right in there. And you've got a nice 300 or 1200 baud modem slotted right in the computer. Now the video output is generally RF output. That's, that's what the, the Commodore VIC-20 assumed you were gonna be using. And it would come with an adapter, much like this one here, where you have an RF adapter and then a standard five pin cable that plugs in. And then you just switch it for whatever TV channel you're using and you have a standard cable going into your, into your TV. Now the superior way to do it is of course with a standard composite cable, but the VIC-20 is designed to work with RF. So you may have to make some internal adjustments to make your composite video look proper. I'll go over that in a few minutes. Now let's talk about these modems just for a minute. Uh, on the, this side here, I have a, uh, an off-brand 300 baud modem. This is the first one that I got from my Commodore VIC-20. And here I have a nice 1200 baud modem that I would have killed for back in the 80s. That jump to, from 300 to 1200 baud was just incredible. Now, Commodore has been cited as the first company ever to come out with a modem for a computer for less than $100. Most of them were substantially more than that. And that really helped companies like CompuServe and BBSs really get a foothold in the market because Commodore sold a million of these modems. Not too bad, really. And companies like America Online, they got their start connecting with Commodore computers. But that is a story for another episode. Now, on to the keyboard. It's really a very beautiful keyboard you see that it has some interesting keys like a Commodore key here, run stop key, restore key. All of these have special features just for the Commodore. And each of the keys has its own set of special graphics characters that are accessed either with the Commodore key or the control key. Graphics characters that other computers did not have. They just had standard text. Uh, and you could use these graphics characters for games, for, for adding a little bit of flair to your programs. Really kind of cool. Also has these lovely function keys here that you can program. By default, they don't have any actions of their own, but you can program them yourselves. The lovely Commodore VIC-20 logo. Now there are several different versions of this logo that are out there. Some of them with cool rainbows on them, some of them more generic like this. I'll put a picture of it up so you can see some of the different logos. The different logos generally mean made in a different place, made in a different year. So let's break the warranty open and look inside this little gem. Right here, we have a big heat shield that's covering the circuitry that converts it from nine volts down to five volts. Now, why they didn't just ship this with a five volt AC adapter and ignore all this stuff, I'm not sure. Maybe some of the components actually require nine volts. Behind here, you've got your cartridge slot. Here you have your kernel ROMs and your basic ROMs, each of them eight kilobytes in size. Machine won't run without those. Now this is the heart of the machine. This is the lovely 6502 processor, which was used in an absolute ton of computers back in the day. The Apples, the Ataris, uh, all of them used the 6502. Now, Commodore had the advantage of manufacturing their own, so they were able to keep the costs down on there. Over here, we have the actual RAM. Commodore used SRAM, which does not need to be refreshed like DRAM does, uh, but it is a little bit more expensive. Now, apparently Jack Tramiel used the SRAM in there because they had an abundance of them in the factory, uh, which is great, it's nice and fast. Now, these, because this is an older machine, these are actually 512 bytes each. So each two of them signifies one kilobyte of memory. So really not very dense at all. Here we've got the CIA chips. These control things like the joystick ports, the user ports, uh, keyboard, things like that. Now, if the 6502 CPU 
is the heart of the Vic, then the Vic chip here is the soul. This is where it gets its graphics. This is where it gets its sound. Its distinct personality is right here on this Vic chip. Now I won't rehash all the history of this chip, not all of it, uh, but I will link to some great resources where you can learn more about the, the origins of this chip. In a nutshell, the Vic chip can handle 16 colors at a time, eight foreground colors, and then it can support an eight additional background colors. It can handle 22 columns by 23 rows, which is very small considering most computers of the age were 40 columns, 32 or 40 columns, but it does a pretty good job with its 22. The Vic chip also handles the audio. There's no SID chip in this little guy. The Vic chip handles the audio and it has three audio channels and one noise channel, and they do a pretty good job, all things considered. Once you think about the fact that most of the competitive machines had little audio at all besides a couple of little plinks and bloops with an onboard speaker, this was actually a magnificent piece of engineering. Now, I didn't think too much about the big letters on the Commodore VIC-20 screen when I was 12 years old. They were fine for me, but I didn't know any different. Uh, once I started using it for BBSing, I realized, you know, the, the 22 columns was a little bit uh, bad, so I found a nice 40 column terminal program that actually lets the VIC display a uh, terminal program in 40 columns, which is kind of cool. There were some sacrifices made with the font style, but it absolutely worked. Now, one important thing to note on here are these potentiometers. I mentioned earlier that the VIC is designed to display RF output. That's how they that's how they set this up. That's how they configured everything. Once you hook up a composite cable, you may have to take your VIC and open it up and pull off the little heat shield like this. Take a little screwdriver and while it's on, adjust this potentiometer just a little bit in either direction to brighten up the image or it can even bring an image to a VIC-20 that displays on RF but doesn't display anything on composite. You just give this thing a little turn, boom, composite comes right up. So if your image doesn't look so good on your VIC-20 on your screen, open it up and just very gently adjust these potentiometers and you'll fix your VIC image immediately. Now, the VIC-20 did come with a very paltry five kilobytes of memory. That was fine for computers back in 77 and 78, but by 1980 and 81, eight kilobytes or even 16 kilobytes was the standard for a home computer or even more, and like in the case of the uh, Atari 800, which had up to 48 kilobytes installed. In my humble opinion, the VIC-20 should have shipped with eight kilobytes of memory. Wouldn't have been that hard to do, probably not that much more expensive, but most software vendors would code to the lowest common denominator. So they would make their software run in five kilobytes of memory instead of eight kilobytes of memory, which means you make sacrifices. Would have been better just to go with eight kilobytes in hindsight. Now the VIC-20 can be expanded up to about 40 kilobytes of memory total. You can slot them right in the back in the cartridge slot. Commodore made some 3K expanders with extra basic commands. They made 8K and 16K expanders. And then third parties went out and made uh, 32K expanders uh, and 35K expanders. Now, I understand there's also somebody who made a 64K expander that did a little bit of uh, memory swapping, which would be really cool on a VIC-20. Now, most cartridge games, which is actually how a lot of games on the VIC-20 shipped, shipped on these cartridges. You see, they're a, a pretty good sized little cartridge right there, and they just slot right in the back. But the cool thing is, these had 16K ROMs right on the cartridges, so in effect, they could make 16 kilobyte games, and it wouldn't matter how much memory the VIC-20 had. It would use this for its memory. So cartridge games tended to be a lot bigger and more robust than games that you'd get, say, on a tape. It really is amazing what we could do with a little three and a half kilobytes of memory, though. I remember coding some pretty darn incredible programs in three and a half K where you can remap the character set and make the letter A look like a little dude running and, and just some magnificent things that we could do in three and a half kilobytes. 
Now the VIC-20 actually had pretty good graphics for the day, considering many of its competitors were black and white like the TRS-80 or green screen like the most of the Apples were. Um, a lot of its competitors just didn't have any color at all or very minimal color. So there's a total of 16 colors that the VIC-20 can actually handle. Eight in the foreground which are commonly used and then there's eight background colors too. You can change the colors in basic and let me show you a little bit about that. Now in the VIC-20 we have a 22 by 23 screen. Let me show it to you up in the corner here. Rearrange this, there we go, and we'll just put it right up in the corner right there. Now this screen does seem like it's a pretty odd size, uh, but it's perfectly readable, perfectly usable. Let me give you an example here. Hello world. And now let's put a little red heart there. Red. That little symbol that I put there has just told the computer to switch into red text for the hearts and then switch back to blue text. Space, quote, semicolon, 20, go to 10. So you can see when I create this little program, it does hello world in regular blue text, and then it does the little hearts in red text. You can also have a little more fun here. Let's insert a couple spaces. We're going to make this purple, and then we're going to reverse that text. And I'm just hitting the keys on the keyboard that say purple and reverse and holding down the control key. Then we're going to turn this one green not reversed. Now when we run it, in theory, we have reversed purple, hello, regular green world, and our pretty little red hearts. Now, you try doing that same thing on another computer of this generation, and it's not going to work very well. Each of the characters on the VIC-20 can also be modified and configured fairly easily using basic programs. So you can take the letter A and turn it into a top hat. You can take the letter B and turn it into a little frog. You can then also combine letters together. So you've got uh, maybe uh, A, B, C, D, and each of them is one little part of a character. And then you just have to, in basic or machine language, control those characters on the screen in the new form that you've designed for them in your program, and they look like little characters. It's kind of cool. Now, normally, each character is an 8x8 eight eight block of pixels. And that block of pixels, those pixels, can be one of the eight colors. There are multicolor modes which allow you to use up to three different colors but what happens is that the pixels are now four pixels across by eight down which gives the VIC-20 games that use this kind of uh, multi-colored images its very blocky look. Let me show you the difference between VIC Avenger and Galaxian and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now when you're looking at these pick these characters here on the screen, you'll see they're fairly recognizable. They're each a solid color, purple, blue, green, whatever color, and they all look pretty good and pretty easy to, to recognize. And this, by the way, is a fantastic version of Space Invaders. Now when we switch over to Galaxian, you can already see on the screen there that the characters look blockier and less recognizable, but definitely more colorful. Let's bring the actual game up. You can see that they're using 
uh, two or three colors on each one, but the colors themselves are quite blocky. The, the characters themselves are quite blocky. And you'll see this in a lot of VIC-20 games. The more colorful you get, the more blocky everything appears. But surprisingly, the gameplay is absolutely awesome in here. The player stinks, but the gameplay is actually quite good. Now here on a game like Choplifter, you're going to notice the graphics appear to be fairly high resolution, but they're all single color. And these are actually just characters on the screen, being written on the screen and being remapped as they go along. So that apparent smooth scrolling of that little bubble there is actually just a bunch of characters moving across the screen and the program is recreating the characters as they move along the screen. It's actually pretty clever coding. This is one of the nicer games on the uh, machine. You can see it is using single colors though. It's not using any multicolor modes. So the, the, the graphics appear to be, oops, that was good, higher resolution. Now there were no sprites on the VIC-20. Those did not come along until the Commodore 64, nor was there built-in smooth scrolling like on the Commodore 64. So writers had to be a little more creative with how they made their games, but that does not mean that they couldn't do a good job. On one hand, you've got something like Donkey Kong here, which is uh, fairly blocky, but absolutely recognizable. Let's take a look at a few of the other games that really did an exemplary job on the VIC-20. Now one of my favorites is Demon Attack by a Magic. I mean, just take a look at these colors here. This is, this is an eight color system, you know, eight foreground, eight background colors. But in a nutshell, it's only really using eight colors here. The audio, as you can hear, is also quite nice on here. Here's another one that does a particularly good job, also by a Magic. They did a fantastic job on the Vic of a program called Dragonfire that was available for a lot of different platforms. Look at the colors on these treasures here. And the animation on the dragon and the fire, considering the Vic did not support smooth scrolling, really not too shabby at all. This is such a hard game after you get to about the fifth dragon. Jeez, look at him. That ain't fair. That ain't right. But take a look at the color and the speed of this game. I had this on the Atari 2600, played it about 18 million times. The VIC-20 version looks better in some ways, not quite as good as some ways in the, as the Atari 2600. Look at the speed of these planes. With the right coding and effort, you could really get some incredible games out of the VIC-20. You really had to try hard, but you could get some incredible games out of the VIC-20. The audio was not too bad either. You heard a few little uh, things on the games that I was playing there. The audio wasn't bad, all things considered. It's no SID chip, it's no pokey in the Atari 800 line. But then again, this was a machine that cost a hundred dollars compared to 300, 400, or 500 of all of its nearest competitors. Now, once you got your VIC-20, 
everybody needed a way to save data on it. By default, the most popular way to save data on your computer was with the data set. This is an audio cassette recorder that's specifically designed for the Commodore series. It actually saves things uh, digitally instead of analog like a lot of its competitors did. So you didn't have to mess with a bunch of little uh, settings on here in order to get it to work. Basically all you do is you either type load and it will then load the first thing on the tape or you could put a name in and actually have uh, it search for a particular name. But everything's saved sequentially on a data set. So if you have a game stored at uh, counter number 500 and you hit put in the name and hit play at counter number zero, it's gonna go all the way up to 500 before it reaches that. So what we would generally do is we would write on the, the cassette cartridges, you know, this game's at 200, this game is at 400 on the little counter, and we'd fast forward it to that point before we started loading the game in. Let's load something up real quick, or real slow as the case may be. You hit shift and then run stop on the keyboard. That's actually, it just means shift run. It asks you to press play on the tape. We'll press play and it goes ahead and it goes out and it searches for the very first program that it can find on the tape cassette. In a second, in theory, we should find something. You see here, it's found the game Race Loader, which basically is a stub program in this particular case. This was one I typed in from a magazine probably in about 1982, maybe 83. It's a racing game, uh, horse racing. and the stub loader first loads in all the graphics characters and assigns the graphics characters. Then it deletes itself and loads in the rest of the program. That's how it's able to work such a cute little program, a neat little program, in only three and a half kilobytes of memory. See, it's, it's loaded up the stub program. Now it's actually loading up the rest of it. It's gonna take another minute to do that. It took about two, two and a half minutes to load up the program. Again, this is a three and a half kilobyte program. It's not a horribly long time. I mean, you guys know in your Commodore 64s, sometimes loading a game would take 10, 15 minutes unless it had fast loading technology built right into it. Two and a half minutes on a VIC, not so bad. So in this game, we it's a horse racing game. Uh, let's see, the name of the player is Tenmark. Let's see, four horses. We've got Amiga Bill, Boat, Aaron, and Pixel Vixen. Those are our four horses. I can make my bet here. Let's see, I'm gonna bet $200 on, oh, uh, who's gonna win this one? I think Amiga Bill is gonna be beat everybody. All bets are down. Now, our little horses are racing, and uh, I bet on Amiga Bill, who I believe was the top one right there. So we're gonna go through and see who wins. Now, you'll notice on the scrolling on this little guy, this is done by redefining the character set and then changing which characters are running along here. If we were to look at this without the character set divine, defined, we might see just random characters appearing and changing on the screen as it writes the little uh, characters down, but it gives it the illusion of actual movement and actual fairly smooth movement. Come on, Amiga Bill, you can do it. Win me that money. Oh, he's ahead, he's ahead. But I've seen him pull, come on, come on, come on. Look at that, 600 bucks I just won. Thanks, Amiga Bill. I appreciate that. Now, in about 1982, Commodore introduced a disk drive for the computer. They first introduced the 1540 drive, which was a very nice one. I actually have a real 1540 drive right here, white one. It's missing the faceplate, which just breaks my heart, but it says 1540 right in the back. Now the 1540 is actually physically faster than a 1541, and the VIC can keep up because of its 
smaller screen real estate. If you put a 1540 drive on a Commodore 64, it will work only if you blank the screen. Then it, it has enough horsepower to load things in that fast. Kind of funny. So they came out with a 1541 a year or so later that works on both Commodore 64 and a little slower on the VIC-20. Now the awesome thing is I can hook up any kind of IEC device to this. I hook up my 1571 drives to it sometimes. They work just fine. I hook up my nice 1581 drive. Let's see if I can get this little guy in the view here. There she is. My nice 1581, three and a half inch floppy. Works absolutely perfect on my VIC-20. No problems at all, sees the full capacity. And it does this because on the Commodore drives, all of the brains are built right into the drives themselves. Each of these drives has its own 6502 processor, one or two kilobytes of memory, its own uh, processing chips, and it just receives commands from the computer, load this. Then the computer on the, the device takes over, sends the stuff on down. So it can use any device you throw at it, including the SD to IEC devices that I recommend that you get from the Futures 8-bit. Those guys are fantastic. And you can then find any program file, any D64 file that's designed for the VIC-20, throw it on an SD card, and it just opens right up. Works absolutely beautifully. Now, it really would have been nice if Commodore had given us a little better uh, disk and DOS commands with the VIC-20 and then after that with the Commodore 64, but they didn't, so we have to live with what we have to live with. So just for an example, I've got a basic program running here, exciting one that says Chickenhead Chronicles. So that program is in memory. Now if I want to go and see what's on my floppy disk, I have to load the actual contents of the directory into memory with load dollar sign comma eight. Once I load that in, it loads it up and it makes it into basically a basic program and I can see what's on my drive, but the program I just had in memory is wiped out. Now there's been more than one time in the history of Commodores that somebody's put a lot of effort into their program and then they want to load a directory to see what then maybe the name of their program is and they wipe out half hour hour of work it happens it would have been nice if they'd done it differently now the VIC-20 was in production from 1981 until 1985 it had sold somewhere between maybe two and a half and three million units no one's quite 100% sure how many have sold it was credited with being the very first computer in history to sell over one million computers though, and that is a fact. Now, Jack Tramiel from Commodore wanted to make a computer that he could sell in the retail market instead of just the, uh, the licensed distributor market. And he went ahead and went with the VIC-20 with that. Now, there is a very, very interesting story behind the VIC-20. And, and how it came to be and who was involved in it. I won't go into all of the details of that at this point in time. You can find a lot of information on it on the VIC-20 wiki, which I'll link to, and also on 8-Bit Guy's really nice History of the Commodore VIC-20 video. I'll also, I'll also link to that. One thing I do want to mention is Michael Tomzik. He's a very active member on the Commodore VIC-20 Facebook group, and he's recently been spending a lot of time talking about the history of the VIC-20 and uploading really cool documents that relate to the history of the VIC-20. Some of them are his personal notes. Some of them are like letters to Jack explaining what he wants to do and, and, and explaining how he fought for certain features in the VIC-20. It's really fascinating. Now, he's also written a book about the history of microcomputers and spends a lot of time in the history of Commodore. I'm going to put an image of the book right there and a link to where hopefully you can still buy it. Now, the VIC-20 community is actually still quite active today. We've got a couple thousand people member of the VIC-20 group. 
there are still new games being written for the VIC-20. Uh, for example, the Futures 8-Bit publishes the incredible Rodman for the VIC-20, the incredible Cheese and Onion for the VIC-20, and, and many, many more games. I'll put a link to their website down here. And games like Realms of Quest 5 and Fire, and some new ones that are coming out soon, are being published by my friend Jeremy at Double Sided Games. I'll put a link to his website here. Uh, this is Realms of Quest 5, which is an absolutely incredible role playing game. Okay, these are the actual VIC 20 graphics for this game. Okay, buy this game. I did a review for it a couple of weeks back. I'll put a link to the review in the description. But buy this game. There's also lots of hardware that's available for the VIC-20. By far, my favorite piece of hardware, and I've mentioned it several times in past videos, is the penultimate cartridge that's distributed by The Future Was 8-Bit and created by Tinsmouth Software. This thing will allow you to set your memory on your VIC-20 from zero additional kilo kilobytes up to 35 additional kilobytes and any place in between. It has a built-in super expander, built-in basic 4.0. It has dozens and dozens of games on board. This is one of them right here that's playing in the background. This thing is an absolute steal. If you get just one thing for your Commodore VIC-20, get the penultimate cartridge. It's fantastic. There are also other people that make great expansion cartridges for the VIC-20. Some of them have games on ROM. Some you can put your own games on ROM. Some just have memory expansion. There's a lot of really great ones out there. There's Wi-Fi modems. You can get your VIC-20 online and use it for FTP. And I've even heard some people can use it for basic text web browsing by connecting up to your Wi-Fi network and then using that as if it was a, a dial-up modem. Really cool stuff. And there's a great software utility for your PC called Turbo Rascal. And I'll put the link to the guy's website down here. Now what this does, this allows you to create games in a Pascal-like language for the VIC-20, Commodore 64, and the NES. It's really designed to, to hit the hardware of like the 6502 chip. And there's been some great games, including the, a brand new one called a Nibbler that's coming out from the Futures 8-bit in, in a couple of weeks and some great VIC-20 demos that have come out created from this software. So what do I use my VIC-20 for? A lot of it is games, honestly. I think there's some really fun games on there. I also collect a fair number of VIC-20 cartridges. I've got probably a total of about 15 of them, like my Atlantis game, Jawbreaker 2, which is actually pretty good. Sargon 2 Chess, Mole Attack. So I collect quite a few VIC-20 cartridges. And I'm always on the lookout for more. The VIC-20 is also a great machine to learn programming on because it honestly is very simple. Accessing the graphics, accessing the sound. Once you get used to using the pokes and the peaks to access it in basic, it's really not that bad. Uh, if you get a cartridge like the penultimate here and you have access to the super expander on there, you even have better graphics capabilities that are accessible to you with new basic commands. It's also fairly straightforward to learn machine language on this one, again, because it's fairly simple 6502 machine language. So if you want to cut your teeth making some simple stuff and then move on to more powerful machines, this may be a good place to start. It's not too hard to find a VIC-20 nowadays. On eBay, I can usually find one or two of them at any point in time. They generally go for somewhere between $80 and $120, may have a data set with them, may have a couple of cartridges with them. And uh, you know the, the days of going into a swap meet and getting one for $10, $15, they're few and far between now. If you get lucky, maybe, but you're gonna spend $80 to $100 on a, on a new VIC-20. 
you can also download the free Vice emulator or buy the C64 Forever package from Cloanto, which uses the Vice emulator. Both of them are going to give you full VIC-20 access on your PC. Uh, it emulates any kind of memory you want. It emulates different kinds of hardware. You can use it for playing VIC-20 games right on your PC and it works absolutely beautifully. Use that if you don't have the real hardware. If you do get a real VIC-20, do yourself a favor. In addition to getting, getting the penultimate cartridge, get yourself an SD to IEC. That's this little guy here. Looks like a little 1541 drive here. It's a little cutie. It allows you to put an SD card in there and then throw on either .d64 files, which are complete 170 kilobyte files that work on the VIC-20 or the C64, or .prg files, which are just standard program files for the VIC-20, of which there's hundreds you can download. You can use it to play games. You can use it to save your files to if you don't have a 1540 or a 1541 disk drive. Absolutely beautiful addition to it. As a matter of fact, there are so many great games for the VIC-20 that I've been having such a fun time playing and experimenting with that I'm creating a new series. It's called VIC-20 5 Kilobyte Reviews and it's going to be reviewing both new and old VIC-20 games all in under five minutes. Now, the, now please pick yourself off the floor from laughing where 10 minute Amiga Retrocast is going to make a video that's only five minutes, yeah, sure. But I'm really gonna try very hard to keep these very short, very sweet, very to the point. I think they're gonna be fun. As a matter of fact, here's a little bit of the preview of the introduction for it that was created on my VIC-20. So, what's my opinion of the VIC-20? It's not just nostalgia talking. It's also a really cool platform. It's a lot of fun. It really is easy to get into, especially if you get a hold of the original VIC-20 manual. You can have yourself coding in BASIC really quickly. In like a day, you can, you can do it. I've been seeing a lot of people on Facebook who are introducing their kids to the VIC-20 and they're getting started programming on there, which I think is absolutely awesome. My son loves to play it. We come out here and we play a lot of VIC-20 games together and he's almost 15 years old. I enjoy spending time on it. I enjoy coding on it. It's a lot of fun. Get one. So I hope you enjoyed our little tour of the Commodore VIC-20. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, signing out.